place back there. Fill it up, fill it up, fill it up. Okay? Some of you need to fill it up twice because I know you missed last week. <laughs> and there's a connect card. You got something you need to talk about? You need something you need to hear about? On the back here, let's connect. It can be private. It can be for Pastor Tommy alone. Write your needs down and get it to us. Thank you. Praise God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, praise God. What a wonderful day you've given us. What a wonderful life filled with hope and mercy and peace because of what you've already done for us. Lord, though we may not be able to fully grasp the magnitude of what you've done for us, Lord, your death on the cross on that Sunday morning, the first day, when we went to see where you were, Lord, you were up and risen. You were risen from the grave to show us the way to show us the way to heaven, hallelujah. Lord, you've been so good to us, so kind, so merciful, so wonderful. We gather today to worship your name, to thank you. And I pray, Lord, for all of us here that your will be done in our lives, each and every day of our lives. Let us reflect you in all that we say and do with one another and with the rest of the world, Lord. Let your peace go before us, Lord. And let us always continue to rejoice in your mercy. Towards each and every one of us, Father, in Jesus' name, in the holy name of Jesus, we all say, Amen. 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 So, when I'm through with the message today, I'm going to walk right up the center, which I normally don't do. I'm going to go up there on the porch, and I don't know if you noticed or not, but up on the porch is a giant, or life-size, I would say, wooden cross. And you'll be handed here shortly little pieces of paper. We do this every year. I started doing this in 2003. Um, and then I was the worship pastor here. And I uh, became senior pastor in upstate New York and all around the country, and and then came back here home, what it feels like to me. And I hope it feels like home to you. I realize we're in this tent, and it's going to be hot and muggy sometimes. At some point soon, we'll have to move up onto the, uh, onto the porch like we started, because it'll, it'll be rainy season, and it may just be too hot out here. Uh, if we got all the fans we really need, it would probably be so noisy, although I don't know that. But we'll see. So just work with us on that if you would. Um, uh, I, I, I love the spirit that is in this tent. It, it, it just kind of came in when we moved out here. Um, and I know that we will take this spirit of God that, we, that we're experiencing here and back inside the building when it's done uh, sometime next year. So. <laughs> I do not know when it will be done. We're hoping that uh, worst case scenario I'm told, the interior anyway, by mid-June. I'm not being pessimistic, Lord, but I don't see that happening. Uh, because of the, the, the inspections and the permits and all the... I mean, we're, we're sitting right now, been almost two weeks, nothing been able to be done. But we're waiting on permits and contractors and, and you can imagine all the devastation everybody's waiting we're still waiting on the insurance company too so uh, anyway waiting is the game at this point and I'm trusting in the Lord as frustrating as I get up some mornings and come in here and see this place and it just frustrates me to no end but at the same time I see this place this church for what it will be not for what it is but what it will be and it is going to be a wonderful place so to worship in. But I love it out here, and I know many of you do as well. So uh, if you're on the side over here, y'all, and you're hot, please, let's move on over here. Move. There's nothing wrong with getting up and moving. There's a seat over here. There's a seat over here. There's no reason for you to sit in the sun if you're baking. Anybody want to move now? <laughs> For a small fee. No? I mean, really, don't sit in the sun. There's no need to. You're, you're not proving anything. Other than you're 
going to have a sunburn. Here comes one. Anybody else? Now, as I was saying, when I get, when I go up to the cross, um, there'll be some people up there to instruct you. And what I'll ask you to do, I'm asking you now, when you get, so when you get the paper, you know, there'll be some pens or pencils. Uh, if you would just write on there what it is you would like to just nail to that cross and not pick it up again. Uh, it can be whatever it is. If there's something you're struggling with, a particular sin you're still dealing with, or unforgiveness, or what, whatever, it's entirely up to you. If you're worried about your loved ones so much, it occupies so much of your time, and you just want to nail that thing to the cross and be done with it and let the Lord have it. It's very symbolic, but it's also very powerful when we, when I show you what we will do. Uh, and so, uh, I will, we'll hand those out to you shortly. And uh, you can be writing on those. If you need an extra long piece of paper, uh, I, know, I know some of you, yeah, Bob, uh, and Steve asked for, yeah, a stapler as well, and a nail gun. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I just want to prepare you for that. Right? Um, how many of you have your Bibles this morning? Or some form of the Bible. Maybe it's in your... Uh, Maybe it's on your cell phone. You have the Bible app. That counts. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for your presence here. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful for your word. God, I pray that you would cause these words to come off these pages as you intended today. Sink them deep into our heart and water them with your Holy Spirit that they may grow and grow us for your glory and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to open them, which I assume you would, to Matthew chapter 28. Now that's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 28. Before I read the scripture, I want to admit, I want to talk a little bit of, real quick about the the event next Friday night. Um, it starts at 7. It's just going to be me and my guitar. Um, I've never done this before um, for any church I've had. I've had for six churches. Um, but I feel like I need to do this. It's, it's part of who I am or definitely who I used to be uh, and spent 15 years of my life in Nashville. Uh, and so uh, I, want it, I want you to enjoy these songs, and I'll enjoy it because I haven't played a lot of them in years. Um, so there'll be a lot of uh, mistakes <laughs> on my part, and there may even be some tears on my part. Now she'll share stories with you of my journey through those songs, uh, and some of the songwriters that I was privileged to, to write with, and some of the artists who recorded some of the material. Uh, so anyway, I, I meant to say that earlier, I apologize. I wanted to cover that before. So please come at 7 o'clock. Bring whoever you want to. It'll be cool inside here. Um, and we'll we'll have more chairs if we need them. Okay? We can sit all around. No big thing. All right? Let's read the Word of God together. Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold... A severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And this appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. That's pretty white. The guards shook for fear of him and became the guards, excuse me, became like dead men. They became so afraid they knocked them out. The fear of God knocked them clean out. The guard shook for fear. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus has been crucified. Can you imagine an angel sitting on top of a stone and you walk up expecting to go and anoint the body of your dead Savior? And there's an angel sitting on top saying, Hey, don't be afraid. That, that's cool. I wish I could. He's not here. For he has risen, 
just as he said. And then the angel says, come and see the place where he was lying. <laughs> what is so important? People ask me this question all the time, and not necessarily Christians. They say, what's so important about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Jesus, we know, suffered horribly on the cross because He loves us. He rose again three days later because He loves us. Period. Now, so when people ask me that, I say, love. Love put Him up there, love kept Him there, and, and love brought Him out of the grave. Now, what was accomplished uh, by his death and resurrection is what we celebrate today, right? Especially today on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. And, you know, this is brand new and it's not working today. Isn't that interesting? Ah, there you go. Wow. So, in order to fully grasp, I quit laughing at me, God's love for us. It's important, I think, to understand what Christ endured on the cross. Now, maybe you've heard this before, maybe you haven't, but I always like to give you the benefit of the doubt because there are many folks here who, who have never heard this, and many, many of you have, so just suffer through it, if you would, please. The crucifixion was invented by the Persians. Isn't that nice? Iranians. Persia. Between 300 and 400 B.C. It was the most, and quite possibly the most Severe, painful death ever invented by humankind. We, we can invent some horrific things, can't we? And its punishment was reserved for slaves or foreigners or revolutionary rebels and usually the vilest of criminals, so murderers and such. So after the Passover celebration, Jesus takes his disciples to Gethsemane, the garden, to pray. And during his prayer, uh, about the events that are to come that he knows he's going to face, Jesus sweats drops of blood. Now there is a rare medical condition. Are there any doctors or nurses here? Any? I know there are a few. Dr. Larry. There's a condition called hematophidrosis. Hematophidrosis, in which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands break down. And blood re blood released from the vessels mixes with sweat. Therefore, the body sweats blood, drops of blood, and it's usually like a, a mist, and it can get, you know, where it actually drips everywhere because of the sweat. The mist of blood appears on the skin, everywhere. So, that condition results from severe mental anguish or high anxiety. How many of you have anxiety? A lot of people suffer with it. Not like this. It's a state Jesus expresses. He says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. That's in Matthew 26. Before he ever gets to the whipping, hemotophidrosis makes the skin very tender. So at this point, Jesus' physical condition worsens slightly. Right? Now, traveling from Pilate to Herod, they... they the Sanhedrin take him, the Pharisees really take him to Herod, and then they take him uh, to, uh, back to uh, Pontius Pilate. He walked approximately two and a half miles. He's not slept, and he's been mocked, and he's been beaten, and in addition, his skin remains tender from the hematophidrosis. Boy, I'm glad I'm not a boy. His physical condition worsens. Pilate ordered Jesus to be flogged as required by Roman law before crucifixion. What a law that is. How are you going to be crucified? But first, you're going to get beaten. Traditionally, the accused stands naked and the flogging covers the area from the shoulders to the knees. Nothing usually below. Now, what he was whipped with, we've probably all heard this, but consisted of several strips of leather and inside that leather were metal balls that also had but fragments of goat bone. 
her sheep bone. So when the bone makes contact with Jesus' skin, it digs into his muscles, tearing out chunks of flesh and skin, and it digs deep, and then it exposes when they pull away the bone beneath. The flogging leaves the skin on Jesus' back in long ribbons. Now this is uh, all taken from what accounts of, of crucifixion, but also medically what happens. So the flogging leaves the skin on Jesus' back and the bone beneath exposed. By this point, there's obviously a great loss of blood, which causes his blood, uh, has, he's lost so much of blood that it causes his blood pressure to fall. And that puts him into shock. Jesus' thirst in, in, in his body is a natural thing as he responds to the suffering and he says, I thirst in John chapter 19. Roman soldiers place a crown of thorns on his head and a robe on his back. Now they're mocking him for being king of the Jews, right? So you've seen those type of thorns that are very, very long, very, very thick. And so the robe puts on his back helps clot the blood and helps prevent him from sustaining more blood loss. But as they hit him in the head, they strike him in the head, put, it pushes those thorns deeper into his flesh. And this is our Lord Jesus we're talking about here, folks. They cause severe, would have caused severe nerve damage that supplies the face, the nerves, down his face and down his neck. And as they mock him, they also belittle him and they spit on him. Then they rip the robe off. Now, can you imagine? You ever ripped a bandage off? They rip this robe off that has kept this, these wounds from bleeding, and the bleeding starts all over again. Jesus' physical condition becomes critical due to severe blood loss without replacement, so he's undoubtedly going into a deeper shock. And at one point, he can't carry the cross out of the city and up to the hill into Golgotha. So Simon of Serene is given the responsibility by the guards. Why am I going through this? Because we don't, didn't do and don't do a Friday, Good Friday service where we normally talk about this sort of thing. And I think this is very, very important what we need to know. Okay. I realize this isn't part of the resurrection, but it's getting there. Jesus was likely not on what we call the Latin cross, the full cross that's up there, but rather what they call a tau cross, a T-A-U, tau for the Greek letter T, and it looks like a T. Okay. The vertical piece is called the stipes, S-T-I-P-E-S, and that remains in the ground. That's already up there. See, they, they, would, they would crucify sometimes 200 people a day, okay. but there wasn't very many of them on this day, so they have plenty of time to inflict the damage and take their time with these folks, and especially on Jesus. So Jesus carries only the horizontal piece. That's called the patibulum, P-A-T-I-B-U-L-U-M, up the hill. And at the top of the patibulum is a sign, it's called the titulus, T-I-T-U-L-U-S, and it indicates that a criminal, or that a, me, a trial occurred. And, uh, and so his, his crimes are put on there, on that, indicating, you know, again, that a trial had occurred, and his crime reads, this is the king of the Jews. That's his crime, folks, in Luke 23. And when they reach the top of the hill, Jesus is thrown to the ground, reopening those wounds that are grinding in the dirt, causing more bleeding, and they have to throw him down because he has to be nailed to this thing now that he's carried. Okay? So they nail his hands to the patibulum. The huge nail, which is seven to nine inches long, damages or probably severs the major nerve to the hand, the median nerve, upon impact. This causes continuous agonizing pain up both arms. Once he is secured, the guards lift the patibulum with these ropes and they secure it to the, to the uh, cross, to the stipes. And as it is lifted, you can imagine just the weight on the hands and the arms. 
his full weight as he pulls down on those nails and his shoulders and his elbows dislocate because of that weight. He can't take any weight off. It's a strange position for the body to be in. And in this position, Jesus' arms stretch. I don't know if you know this, but they stretch to a minimum of six inches longer than their original length. And it is highly likely that Jesus' feet were nailed through the tops, as is typically pictured, but not through the bone. Not through the part of the foot between the toes. Because the Bible tells us no bones were broken. So it's in this position. His knees are flexed and on top of the foot piece, just where he can barely reach it, he can't put a whole lot of weight on it. That's part of the torture. It's approximately 90 degrees. And the weight To read this the weight pushes the body down on the nails and the ankles. He has to try to support that weight. The nail would cause severe damage, severing the dorsal pedal artery of the foot and bringing more acute pain. This enlarges, now to breathe, okay? To breathe in, we have a diaphragm, right? Right here. It moves up and down. So, this enlarges the chest cavity when we take a breath in, and, it, uh, and when we inhale, and then to exhale, the diaphragm rises up, which compresses air into the lungs and out for exhalation. So as Jesus hangs on the cross, the weight of his body pulls down on the diaphragm, and air moves into his lungs, but it stays there because he has no, it's so much weight, he has no way to take a breath. So what does he have to do? In order to exhale, he has to push a little on his feet, back and forth, which causes more pain. Not to mention, his back was as exposed as now against a wooden old nasty beam, and he's scraping it every time he tries to take a breath. Right? The back and forth that goes for hours. In order to speak, air has to pass over the vocal cords during exhalation, so the Gospels tell us that Luke spoke, that Jesus spoke seven times on the cross. It was excruciating to speak. It is amazing to me that despite that kind of pain, he still pushes up enough to say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what to do. Now the difficulty surrounding exhalation leads to a slow form of suffocation. Carbon dioxide builds up in the blood, And at the same time, the heart beats faster to circulate available oxygen. The decreased oxygen due to the uh, difficulty in exhaling causes damage to the tissues and the capillaries begin to weaken and, ex and, and it excrete water, fluid, into the blood and into the tissues. This results in a buildup of fluid around the heart and the lungs. The collapsing lungs, failing heart, death, dehydration, and inability to get sufficient oxygen to the tissues essentially suffocates Jesus. He will die of a heart attack, really. The decreased oxygen damages, which uh, lead to that cardiac arrest. After Jesus' death, the soldiers uh, break the legs, we're told, of the two criminals. Why would they do that in John chapter 19? Because they get tired of toying with them, and they don't want to, they, they got to go. The weather's starting to turn. So they break right underneath the kneecap. Can you imagine that? So these gentlemen, or whatever you want to call them, these guilty people in Christ, they cannot raise up to get a breath, so they die soon. Now they got to Jesus, the scripture tells us no bones were broken, they were going to break his knees, and they couldn't because they didn't because he was already dead. But to make sure, they take a pylum, which is a Roman spear, and they stick it up through his, underneath his ribs and into his heart which causes water and blood. Remember the scripture, water and blood flowed from Christ's side. Where did the water come from? I told you. The capillaries are secreting that water. Also the sac around the heart was filling up with fluid. So when they punctured it, water and fluid came out. Have you heard enough yet? I think that emphasizes and should for all of us the true nature of Christ's suffering. And more than that, His great love for you and I. What greater love than this can God have?
of his creation. What more do we want him to do? Now today, America is, America is celebrating what is known as Easter, which really has nothing to do with Easter bunnies and eggs. But the church in America celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest event of all time. It's the most powerful event in history. In our society, most people ask, so what? What difference does the resurrection make to me? And how does that apply to me? So what if Jesus is alive? What's the big deal? What, what does that mean for me? So how can something that happened 2,000 years ago have any bearing on my life today? These were the same basic questions they were asking Paul even back in the first century in the city of Corinth. And it's still being asked today in the 21st century. How important is that resurrection? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Now if Christ has preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection, he says, of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we're even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not, if he did not raise, if the, in fact the dead are not raised, Paul said. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith, my faith, all of our faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then he says also, those who have fallen asleep, died in Christ, have perished. They go nowhere. If we have hope in Christ only in this life, Paul says, we are all people most to be pitied. Only in this life. Paul is saying that Jesus' resurrection is what holds the whole foundation of our faith together. That's why this is important. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all that we believe and hold on to is empty. It's useless. It's void of any meaning. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Paul and all the other believers were nothing but a pack of liars. And you and I remain condemned because of sin. And all those who have died and gone on before us. But then Paul doesn't stop there. He says that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all those who believe should be pitied because their whole life and belief structure is a complete waste of time. Folks, the news is that the good news, Paul goes on in verse 20. But the fact is, Paul said, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. So the resurrection, by the way, is a proven historical fact, and it's a matter of public record. Most people don't want to believe that. The evidence for the resurrection is absolutely overwhelming and can stand up in any court of law today. Well, maybe not today. <laughs> not today. Depends on who the judge is, I suppose. But still, over 80% of people who say they believe in the resurrection do not attend church regularly. And I believe it's because largely they just don't get it. They don't get why the resurrection is so important. What difference does the resurrection of Jesus make? Three reasons very quickly this morning. First, because Jesus rose from the dead. Our sins are forgiven. I don't think there's a person alive that doesn't want to do over somewhere in their life, right? We can have a brand new start in order to right all the dumb mistakes we made. All our failures, all our problems, all the bad decisions, along with the stuff that's tortured us, painful memories throughout the years. And we believe that sometimes we have to pay for the rest of our lives for those things. No, the resurrection of Jesus does away with all that. Scripture tells us having canceled the certificate of death, sin, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to God, has been taken away, having nailed it to the cross. Jesus wiped away our sins by the shedding of His blood. The Bible declares there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And so, perfect, a perfect sacrifice. Not a blemish on it. Nothing wrong on the inside. Jesus said, I'll do it. Once and for all. So by His death, He accomplished what God had planned from the very beginning. And He said, it is finished. He meant that his task, his work, God's purpose were complete and fulfilled. What more was he to do? 
scripture tells us now there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. How many of you are in Christ? If you're in Christ, you're not condemned. You're not condemned. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. There. Jesus says you're not convinced. You want to hold yourself accountable and beat yourself up every day? That's your choice. Jesus says, I forgive you, man. Well, the world could, I don't care what the world could. People are going to say all kinds of evil things about you. And people are going to assume things about you. But And maybe you're guilty. But not to God. So, you want to take the grace of God... Or do you want to listen to what everyone else says about it? Secondly, Jesus rose from the dead and our lives have a purpose. I have come, Christ says, to give life that they may have that more abundantly. He's talking about now too, folks. He's not talking about just heaven. We, we don't just scrounge around on this earth and, and, and be a doormat and have no purpose and just hold on till Jesus comes. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm here. I come now that you can have life and that more abundant. You're going to have the peace and joy of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. The world says, how do we do that? How do we get along without these things? I mean, how do I get along without a Ronco salad shooter, of all things? Or an air fryer? How can we survive without a smart TV? My TV is pretty stupid. Or at least I think it is, because I don't know how to operate it. So I wonder who the stupid one is. Our smartphones that we don't know how to really work smartly. Uh, iPad, computers. I mean, we get up in the morning, first thing we search for is our what? Work myself. How can I make it without <laughs> clear and unscented deodorant? Now that one's definitely on my list of necessities. Now I say those things, they seem frivolous, but listen to me. That's how frivolous walking around holding on to your past is. It's that stupid. You don't have to. Most people today are, are they really living? I don't think so. I think they're just existing. Get up in the morning, go to work, come home, eat dinner, watch some TV or the internet, then go to bed, wash, rinse, repeat the next day. Every now and then you can squeeze, squeeze a, uh, a nice cruise or a vacation in there somewhere. And that's life. Other folks take the King Solomon route and they, they find their purpose through pleasure and prestige and power. But what they don't see is that the end, even Solomon, the wealthiest, most wise man alive, said, it's a waste of time. He says it's vanity of all vanities. It's useless, he says. Useless, useless. It's all bull hockey. Well, I had that part. <laughs> so, so God created us for a purpose. He has a plan for our lives, even before we were born. Paul said, my life is not worth anything. It's not worth doing unless I'm doing the work God has assigned me. What's our job? What have, what have we largely been told to do? Talk to people about Christ and make disciples. That's pretty, that's pretty much it. Now, that involves a whole lot of cool stuff going on in the middle. But hey, you're going to go on vacation, talk to people about Jesus. Simple. Thirdly, because Jesus rose from the dead, we who believe have the Holy Spirit of God within us, and therefore we have the power of through Jesus Christ. It was the resurrection that proved Jesus' power. I'd say that's pretty powerful if you could rise from the dead, would you not? The power over death and the grave. The religious leaders of that day mocked Jesus. And they, they wanted him. They say, oh, prove to us you're the Son of God. And, and if you're all at the cross, come on down from here and prove that they will believe you. Well, they pulled that jump before. And they didn't believe anymore. And so Jesus said, I'm not a carnival worker. I'm not a sword swallower for your enjoyment. So I'm not going to do these things. Although he could. So not only do we have a purpose for our life, but Jesus has given us his power. Not only do we have forgiveness of our sin, 
Jesus has a purpose and gives us power. The power to change, folks, which we cannot. We can't change our habits, our hang-ups, our hurts. We cannot without Christ. It is the power to let go of guilt and grudges and grief that gets you stuck in the past. It is the power to forgive others and keep us going when all we want to do is quit, quite honestly. Now, along with the power of Christ, we have His promise to keep us, uh, to help us live according to the purposes of Christ. Jesus Himself said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. L I F E. No one comes to the Father, to God, except through me. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, John 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life, John chapter 5. Listen to me. Only a fool would go through life totally unprepared for something they know is going to happen. Death. So here's my question. Two questions to you. Do you know where you'll spend eternity, and what do you base that decision upon? The most common answer when people are asked whether they are going to heaven is, I hope so. It's true. I hope so. Isn't this something you'd want to be kind of 100% sure of? Well, it doesn't matter what you believe, Pastor, as long as you're sincere. Yes, it does matter. And if you don't believe in the gospel of Christ, then you're sincerely wrong. Well, I'm a good person. Well, I joined the church. I, I gave up smoking and I quit drinking and cussing mostly. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. See, it seems right to us. we got to give up this. we got to give up that. You don't give up nothing unless God tells you to. If he wants you to clean up your act, which he does, he will tell you in his own way and in his own good time. Going to church, and I quit doing this and I quit doing that because I'm going to church now. No, 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 that's the wrong reason. You may as well go back to doing all that stuff. No, I'm kidding. Don't do it. It's good to quit doing those things, okay? But not for any reason other than Christ and Christ alone. Because if you do it for any other reason, you'll go right back to it. Sitting in a chicken coop, folks, don't make you a chicken. Joining a church and quitting bad habits don't make you free from the condemnation of sin. Salvation and eternal life come out on us through having a personal relationship with Jesus. Eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sinned. Blessed be the God, our Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ whom according to His abundant mercy has begotten to us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter. Because of Jesus' resurrection, our future is secure. Now I'm closing this morning. I want to illustrate a point with a little humor. Very little, but... It's a story... The thief who was on the cross at Jesus' right side said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus says, I say this to you today, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay? I tell you this, some people say, oh no, he said, I tell you this today. Um, no. First of all, in the Greek language, or Hebrew, is it, there's no commas. So they know how the, the cadence goes. And what Jesus said was, I tell you this, today you will be with me in paradise. He said, Lord, remember me. So, he's standing at the gate, this thief is, of the kingdom, and the angel says, why are you here? And the thief said, I don't know. And the angel said, what do you mean you don't know? And the guy said, because I don't know. And the angel became a little frustrated, he said, let me get my supervisor. Well, the supervisor comes over and he says, um, we have a few questions for you, Mr. Thief. Are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> he said, I never heard about that in my life. The supervising angel scratched his head and he said, well, what about the doctrine of Scripture? And the 
this one. You know, Pete just stared back with this blank look. The supervisor asked, on what basis are you here? Well, it wasn't because the Pete went to the temple every day. It wasn't because he offered sacrifices for his sins, and it wasn't because he was baptized, and it wasn't because he might have done a few good things, or that he gave up smoking, drinking, and cussing, or that he knew all of the doctrines of the church. And he couldn't really claim that he was a better person than most people. I mean, he's up on the cross after all. So instead, the thief says, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. That's why I'm here. What we can say is that our salvation church isn't because of what we know, but because of who we know. So what difference does Jesus' resurrection make? Because Jesus died and rose from the dead, our sins are forgiven, we have a purpose in our life, and by the power of Jesus Christ, our eternal future is secured in heaven. My gosh, those are three of the most powerful things we could ever ask for. The message of Jesus' resurrection is that we can have a brand new life and an eternity with God. Praise Jesus Christ. All of God's promises are true. Praise Jesus. God. Praise God Jesus rose from the dead. And because of that, you and I have inherited all the world. And we're going to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus. And Paul said to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Happy resurrection. Now, I'm going to ask you to ask some folks to help me pass these things out. It's going to take a little bit, but I, I intended to pass them out earlier, and I got a little involved there. Uh, so be careful. Be careful with these because the wind will blow them right out of your hands if you're not careful. Somebody help me with these pass them along. There could be three or four or five of them if you like. We need to get them out there quickly. Here, take that back. Get something. Stephanie, get some from some other folks. Now what I want you to do, what I want you to do is what I asked you to do in the beginning. If God is speaking to your heart right now, is it rain? Yes, please. That ain't gonna Go ahead and write on there whatever the Spirit of God has spoken to you about this morning. You're not going to melt here. You'll be okay. Make sure you get one. you didn't get two, y'all. They're real thin. Make sure you didn't get two. They're very thin pieces of paper. You can tell if you have two. You might not get one. Did you get one back there? You got it. Okay. You should have a pen.
you to know something. The reason I chose this type of demonstration, well, I was shown it before many years ago, but what I love about it is that there's nothing here. Uh, and it disappears instantly. There's no residue. There, 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 nothing. It's gone. And to me, it so signifies what happens when we come to Christ and our sin is removed. The nails still remain. Our scars may still be there, but they don't define us, do they? Amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, God, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this beautiful, special day. Thank you, Lord, for those many folks who have come this morning. I pray, God, that you would uh, put this word that's been preached this morning, that's been given, that, God, they would learn from it, grow from it, enhance their faith from it, God. And if there's anything, Lord, that isn't from you and wasn't from you, God, I pray... You would help them to eat the hay and leave the sticks. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. We praise your name today. Bless us as we leave this place, as you have blessed us here. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We always leave with a shout. We always shout when we leave. The Bible says lift up your voice with a shout of triumph. And we're going to say hallelujah on three. And I will see you at the Bible study Tuesday night at 6 here in the tent. Or I'll see you Friday night. Please, please come bring your friends. Just come and enjoy. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to bring anything. Just come. Right? We'll fellowship. Have a good time together. One, two, three. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. Have a beautiful Easter. Thank you. <laughs>